Hi, I'm Codex, and this is my Shadowlands Patch 9.1 Fury Warrior Guide. The purpose of this guide is to help people new to playing Fury in Patch 9.1 get off and running. As you can tell from the video length, there's a lot to cover. If you simply want to be told what the answers are and don't care to understand why those answers are correct, I'll be posting a super condensed version of this guide to my channel in the coming days. I've also done extensive timestamping so that if you don't want to watch the entire video, you can quickly get to the topics that you're interested in or skip things that you don't care about, such as the following disclaimer. This guide is only useful if it makes sense to you and you're able to act on what you've learned. Whether or not it makes sense to you obviously depends on how I explain things. While I'll be doing my best to try and explain everything as clearly as possible, I sometimes have really weird ways of thinking about and describing things. Just because you don't understand something that I'm talking about doesn't mean that it's a confusing topic or that you're not smart enough or good enough to understand it. It means that I did not explain the topic in a way that works for how your brain likes to make sense of things. This is why I encourage you to seek out other guides as well, because someone else might have a way of explaining something that triggers that light bulb moment and makes you finally get it. If you're still confused about any topic that I cover or allude to in this video, feel free to ask about it in the comments, and I will do my best to try and answer it in a way that makes sense for you. The next thing to understand going into this guide is that the information is only accurate as of the start of patch 9.1. Any future theory crafting discoveries, as well as any future patches or hotfixes, could make the information presented in this video entirely wrong. Now, with those disclaimers out of the way, let's get started. The Fury spec revolves around dual wielding in what I call a pump and dump playstyle. The most basic component of this playstyle is to generate rage as quickly as possible and then dump it by using Rampage. There are a ton of other pieces that go into this playstyle, and I'll be talking about them, but all of these pieces end up revolving around generating rage and then spending it on Rampage. So let's start laying some foundation and talking about all of those pieces that make Fury what it is. Fury Warriors generate rage through auto attacks and also our damaging abilities. Our main hand swings generate 6 rage, and our offhand swings generate 3 rage. As for our default abilities, Raging Below generates 12 rage, Bloodthirst generates 8 rage, Whirlwind generates 3 rage plus 1 rage per target that it hits, up to 5 targets. So if it only hits 1 target, then it'll generate 4 rage, and if it hits all 5 targets, then it's going to generate 8. If the target is below 20% health, then we can also use Execute, which generates 20 rage. Ultimately, the numbers that I just threw at you are there so I can be precise. The key takeaway from this is that we have a bunch of abilities, and they generate different amounts of rage. I'll be talking about ability usage in more detail later on, but for now, it's important to try and internalize the idea that Execute generates the most rage, but isn't usable most of the time. And for the abilities that we can always use, Raging Blow generates the most, then Bloodthirst is second, and lastly is Whirlwind. Getting used to this is important because, as previously mentioned, our goal when playing Fury is to generate rage as quickly as possible, and then dump it by using Rampage. Now, depending on what talents you take, you could get other abilities that can generate rage, and it's important to spend some time practicing and getting used to how much rage those abilities grant relative to your other abilities. So, for example, there's Dragon's Roar and Siegebreaker. They both generate 10 rage, putting them between Raging Blow and Bloodthirst, but if you were to talent into Onslaught, that ability gives 15 rage, placing it above Raging Blow. I'll be talking about these talents and abilities in a bit, but before we get there, I still have some more foundation to lay. Because I love terrible analogies, if Fury Warriors are an engine that produced DPS, rage generation is the fuel for that engine, and enrage is the oxygen that enables that fuel to combust and explode. Enrage is a 4 second buff that gives us 15% haste, 10% movement speed, and increases our damage by 11%. The increased damage modifier is affected by our mastery, so even with modest gear, that damage modifier will typically be above 25%. Now, there are two ways to get enrage using Rampage, which always grants Enrage, and using Bloodthirst, which has a 30% chance to proc Enrage. Getting a percent damage increase is obviously good, but because Enrage also grants Haste, it means that we're going to be auto-attacking faster, meaning we're going to generate more Rage from auto-attacks, and we're going to have a shorter global cooldown, which means more abilities that grant Rage. This leads to being able to use Rampage more often, which grants Enrage, and as you can see, we have ourselves a feedback loop. Once you have gotten used to the idea that playing Fury is about generating rage quickly and then spending it on Rampage, the next thing that you want to internalize is that part of how we do that is by maximizing enrage uptime. Or in other words, keeping the enrage buff up as much as possible. Because Fury is all about building rage until we get at least 80 and then can spend it by casting Rampage, our quote-unquote rotation is basically whatever we do in between each Rampage. So understand that whenever I'm talking about a rotation or using damaging abilities, I'm talking about it from the perspective that it's something that we do during the time between two rampages. 
Now, there are a lot of things about the primary Fury Warrior abilities that make them seem way more complicated than they actually are. The cooldowns of Raging Blow and Bloodthirst don't line up nicely to create an immediately recognizable pattern, which means that Fury doesn't have a fixed rotation. Additionally, Raging Blow has multiple charges and has a chance to reset its cooldown, Bloodthirst has a chance to proc and rage, and Whirlwind generates different amounts of rage depending on how many targets it hits. These things add a lot of nuance to mastering the intricacies of the spec, but the principles of when you should use each of these abilities are pretty straightforward. As previously mentioned, for our normal rotational abilities, Raging Blow generates the most rage, followed by Bloodthirst, and then Whirlwind. Conveniently, when looking at single target DPS, the damage that each ability does follows the same hierarchy. This means that generally speaking, you should be prioritizing Raging Blow first, and if you can't use Raging Blow, then you should use Bloodthirst, and if you can't do either, then you should use Whirlwind. Even if you expand this view out to include Execute, the priority doesn't really change. You just put Execute at the top because it generates more rage and does more damage than Raging Blow. However, this hierarchy is not entirely correct, and that's because of Enrage. Bloodthirst has a chance to proc Enrage, and since Enrage is incredibly important to our DPS, that complicates things and changes our priorities in certain situations. Specifically, if you're not enraged, Bloodthirst takes priority over Raging Blow. Now, I personally hate talking about using abilities in terms of priority like this because I think it's too abstract for practical use, but it is the most succinct way of talking generally about deciding to use one ability or another. So now that I've explained it generally, let's talk specifically about what is meant when I say that Bloodthirst takes priority over Raging Blow when you're not enraged, and why. Just like every other DPS spec, the ABC rule applies to Fury, which is an acronym for always be casting. And it means exactly what it says. You should always be using an ability at the moment that the global cooldown ends. Because of the ABC rule, and because of how the cooldowns of Bloodthirst and Raging Blow interact, a significant amount of the time, you don't actually need to think about what ability takes priority, because there's no decision to make. You're just going to be using the one that's available. And then if you can't do either, you're going to use Whirlwind. Now obviously, sometimes you will have to decide between a Bloodthirst and a Raging Blow. That is, both of them are off cooldown, and therefore implies that your next two global cooldowns are going to be a Bloodthirst and a Raging Blow, and you just simply have to decide what do you do first. If you're not enraged and did Raging Blow, then Bloodthirst, you're going to get the damage of a Raging Blow and a Bloodthirst, just as one would expect. However, if you did a Bloodthirst, then a Raging Blow, you're going to get the damage of a Bloodthirst, and 30% of the time, you're going to get an Enrage proc which means that you're going to get the damage of an enraged Raging Blow, which, even if you account for all of the variables that I'm purposely omitting for simplicity, it still ends up being more damage to do Bloodthirst first, even though it does less damage. Now, if you already are enraged, then the order doesn't affect the outcome of the damage, and therefore, you should start with whichever one does the most damage, aka Raging Blow. So let's take all this information and tie it back together and then put a bow on it. Once you have enough rage to use Rampage, you should do it. In between using Rampage, if you can use Execute, you should use it. If Execute isn't available or is on cooldown, you should use Raging Blow as much as you can, and if you can't use Raging Blow, then use Bloodthirst. If you're not enraged and have to decide between using Raging Blow and Bloodthirst, then you should use Bloodthirst. If you can't do anything else, then fill that global cooldown with a Whirlwind. Make sure to practice this basic rotation until you can do it without thinking. Pretty much every other thing that we do in terms of doing damage as a Fury Warrior leverages this rotation as its foundation. Now, a reasonable thing to ask is, if maximizing enraged uptime is so important that we're willing to modify our rotation to maximize it, if we're already enraged and can use Rampage, should we delay that Rampage to try and maximize enraged uptime? The answer to that question is that while it would make sense to do that, because Blizzard increased the cost of Rampage to 80 Rage when Shadowlands was released, Delaying a Rampage at any raise level risks rage capping yourself, which is not desirable. I have a video where I rant about this problem and why the change should be reverted, but long story short, if Rampage is usable, you should use it immediately rather than delaying it to try and increase your enrage uptime. AoE follows the same principle as single target DPS, but adds a new variable, Whirlwind Stacks. Whenever you use Whirlwind, you get two stacks of a buff that allows your other abilities to hit four extra targets for just under half the damage that it did to the main target. This means that if there are two targets, then it's not as important to cleave every single ability that you do, and your primary goal for handling Whirlwind stacks is to ensure that you have Whirlwind up whenever you use Rampage so that you can cleave it onto the second target. If there are three or more targets, you want to make sure that you have the Whirlwind buff up every single time you use another ability. And because you get two stacks of Whirlwind, this means that you should be using Whirlwind every third ability. While ideally, you should never overcap your rage, because of how much extra damage is provided by a cleave rampage, if you need to delay a rampage in order to get the whirlwind buff up, it's better to whirlwind, overcap your rage, than cleave a rampage than it is to rampage a single target. 
Recklessness doubles your rage generation and gives your abilities 20% increased crit chance. Recklessness has a base cooldown of 90 seconds and a base duration of 10 seconds. It's also off the global cooldown, so you can use it at the same time as other abilities. Generally speaking, Recklessness should be used as soon as possible every time it's available. The best time to use Recklessness during combat is immediately after a Rampage because it doesn't generate rage, and you can't be caught off guard by the extra rage generation and accidentally rage cap yourself because you just spent 80 rage that global cooldown. Bladestorm is an optional cooldown that Fury Warriors can get if they talent into it. Bladestorm does a fixed amount of AoE damage and generates 20 rage over 4 seconds, with that duration being reduced by haste, making it so that it will do the same amount of damage over a shorter period of time. While Bladestorming, you can auto-attack, but you can't use other abilities. Bladestorm has a cooldown of 1 minute, and unlike Recklessness, Bladestorm is on the global cooldown, but the same logic applies. Ideally, you should be using Bladestorm immediately after a Rampage, and that's because you want to be enraged when you're Bladestorming because it will make a massive amount of difference in the damage that it does. If you're Bladestorming and you get enough rage to cast Rampage, if there's only one target, you should cancel the Bladestorm buff and then use Rampage. However, if there's two or more targets, then you should just let the Bladestorm go for its full duration, even if that means that you're going to overcap on Rage. The easiest way to remove the Bladestorm buff is to create a macro that includes the line slash cancel aura Bladestorm. I personally macro this into casting Rampage, and I've put that macro in the video description. Siegebreaker is an optional 30 second cooldown ability that can be talented into. Siegebreaker is a single target ability that generates 10 Rage and it applies a 10 second debuff that increases the damage that you do to the target by 15%. The optimal time to use this ability is right before a Rampage, so that way you can maximize the number of times that you get to use Rampage within that 10 second duration. It's also worth noting that this debuff can be cleaved onto other mobs via Whirlwind. Dragon's Roar is an optional cooldown that Fury Warriors can get if they talent into it. It has a 30 second cooldown, generates 10 rage, and provides decent single target DPS with extra burst potential if it crits. While it is an AoE ability, it does reduce damage to extra targets. If you're running Dragon's Roar, the optimal time to use it is when enraged, and also while the Siegebreaker debuff is applied if you're talented into that ability. There are two default talent builds for Fury Warriors, a single target build, and an AoE build. Beyond these default builds, certain combinations of Covenants and Legendaries will incentivize taking certain talents, so please understand that the builds that I am about to discuss are the generally best ones, but your choice of Covenant and Legendary might make a different talent build better for you. I'll be talking about this as those variances come up in the Covenant and Legendary sections, but just to remember to always sim yourself to precisely see what's best for your setup. The default single target build takes Sudden Death in the first row of talents, and this is because the value of the other first row talents depend on there being other mobs around, whereas Sudden Death does not. In the second row, you're typically going to want to take Double Time, which greatly improves our movement capabilities. However, in Mythic Plus or in PvP, it's not uncommon to take Stormbolt instead of Double Time to gain the utility provided by the 4 second stun. In the third row, you're typically going to take Frenzy. It's worth noting though that Frenzy loses a lot of value if you lose your stacks. So if you're going to have to spend extended periods of time away from the target or have to do target swapping, it might be best to take Massacre instead. Onslaught is also poorly tuned and is generally considered to be a pretty garbage talent. So currently it's very rare that you would ever consider taking that one. In the fourth row, you're typically going to want to take War Paint for the extra survivability that it provides, though the movement speed provided by Bounding Stride is incredibly fun to play with. So if you don't mind making your healer sad, then don't be afraid to grab that one instead. In the fifth row, you're going to want to take Cruelty. This adds another damage multiplier to your Raging Blow when you use it while enraged, and also increases the chance for it to reset its cooldown. Seethe and Frothing Berserker are decent talents, but generally don't provide as much consistent single target DPS as Cruelty. The value of Seethe also depends on how much crit we have, and unfortunately for the talent, crit is not one of our top priorities for secondary stats. In the 6th row, you're going to want to take Bladestorm or Dragon's Roar. Prior to 9.1, the de facto best legendary for Fury Warriors revolved around using cooldowns such as Bladestorm. Now in 9.1, depending on your Covenant and Legendary setup, Dragon's Roar might be the best choice for single target fights. Meat Cleaver is only useful in AoE, and even then it's nowhere near as strong as Bladestorm, so we just basically never take it. In the 7th and final row, you're going to want to take Anger Management, which causes Spending Rage to reduce the remaining cooldown on Recklessness at a rate of 1 second per 20 Rage spent. And since we only really spend Rage on Rampage, which costs 80 Rage, this means that every single time that we use Rampage, we cut 4 seconds off the remaining cooldown of Recklessness. In practice, this tends to make Recklessness usable roughly every minute, rather than every 90 seconds, which also means that if you're talented into Bladestorm, it's going to line up with that. With that said, certain Covenant and Legendary combinations might make taking Siegebreaker better for single target DPS, which as I mentioned earlier, is a 30 second cooldown ability that increases your damage by 15% for 10 seconds.
The default AoE build only differs from the single target build at two points. Instead of taking Sun Death in the first row, it opts for taking Fresh Meat, and in the third row, it opts for taking Massacre instead of Frenzy. The reason for taking Fresh Meat over Sun Death is because, obviously if it's an AoE fight, there's going to be multiple targets, which means multiple opportunities for you to use Bloodthirst on a new target, which will have a guaranteed enrage proc. And if leveraged optimally, this can result in a significant increase in enrage uptime. The best way that I have found to make the most out of this talent is to create a Bloodthirst macro that has a mouse over component. This will allow you to use Bloodthirst on a mob without having to swap to it. You can find the macro that I personally use in the video description. The reason for taking Massacre over Frenzy is because of the fact that most AoE encounters typically involve doing lots of target swapping, and swapping targets means having to rebuild your Frenzy stacks, which greatly reduces the value of that talent. Warriors are fairly lucky in regards to the fact that our meaningful choice, TM, can actually be somewhat meaningful. This is because all of the Covenants have a niche that they are the best at. Some of these niches are more prevalent than others, but regardless, there are legitimate reasons to decide to go each Covenant. So, let's talk about why you would want to pick a particular Covenant and what the best soul binds for each of them are. Venthyr excels at single target DPS, and as such it does the most single target DPS of all the Covenants. The Venthyr signature ability Condemn replaces Execute, making it usable on targets above 80% as well as targets below 20%, and it makes it do shadow damage rather than physical damage, which is significant because it means that the damage isn't going to be mitigated by the armor of the target. While Venthyr's single target DPS is the highest of all the Covenants, it does relatively lackluster AoE DPS because you're only gaining higher damage cleaved executes rather than a full-on AoE DPS cooldown like you do with some of the other Covenants. If you decide to go Venthyr, the optimal soulbind choice for both single target and AoE fights is Nadja. And for that soulbind, you're going to want to go the path of getting Agent of Chaos and the Potency Conduit, then Dauntless Duelist, and then I would personally suggest going the path of grabbing Sinful Preservation, though there are a lot of potential uses for Nimble Steps. Whereas Venthyr is probably the best single target covenant, Nightfair is probably the best all-round covenant. It generally does the second highest single target DPS, and has the best AoE burst capability. It also provides an extra movement ability, and the Covenant Signature ability Ancient Aftershock also provides decent utility for Mythic Plus in PvP. If you go Night Fae for single target encounters, you're going to want to Soulbind with Naya, then go the path of grabbing the Potency Conduit and Run Without Tiring, then the path of getting the Endurance Conduit plus Naya's Tools, Burrs. Finally, you're going to want to go the path of getting Called Shot. It's also worth noting that because of how Naya's Capstone Soulbind trait works, the optimal thing to do is find another melee player who is not Night Fae, and then have them stand on top of you while you're both away from the other people in melee. This makes it so that you can always get the extra mastery bonus when you use Ancient Aftershock. For AoE encounters in Mythic Plus, you're going to want to Soulbind with Karain, and go the path of getting the Potency Conduit and Horn of the Wild Hunt, then the path of grabbing the Endurance Conduit plus First Strike. After that, you will want to go the path of grabbing Hunt's Exhilaration. If all you care about is doing what's best for the group, then Necrolord is the best choice. While Necrolord Fury Warriors will do less DPS compared to all of the other Covenants, if it's used properly, the DPS that other players gain from the Necrolord signature ability called Conqueror's Banner provides more net rate DPS than all of the other Covenants. Fleshcraft also gives you an extra survivability cooldown, which makes you very tanky. If you decide to go Necrolord, then the highest single target DPS soul bind is Bonesmith Hermir and you should be taking the path of getting the Potency Conduit plus Resourceful Fleshcrafting, then the path of grabbing the Endurance Conduit plus Marrowed Gemstones, and finally, the path with Carver's Eye. It's worth mentioning that Emony's Soulbind trait, Lead by Example, has the potential to provide more net raid DPS than Bonesmith Hermir on single target fights, though that depends on the composition of your party. For AoE fights, it is best to Soulbind with Emony, and then take the path of getting the Potency Conduit plus Emony's Magnificent Skin, then the Endurance Conduit plus Gnashing Chompers, and finally, the path with Soul Slug. Kyrian excels at providing consistent AoE DPS that can compete with Night Fae without having to rely on its burst damage, and on top of that, Kyrian provides a ton of utility in Mythic Plus and PvP in that you have an AoE Root slash Snare on a very short cooldown, as well as having an extra healing potion that also removes a lot of different debuff types. If you decide to go Kyrian, then for single target fights, it's currently best to Soulbind with Pelagos and take the path of getting the Potency Conduit plus Focusing Mantras, and then the path of getting better together. For AoE fights, it's best to Soulbind with Mikanikos, and then go the path of getting the Potency Conduit plus Forge Light Filter, and then the Endurance Conduit plus Hammer of Genesis, and then finally, the path with Soul Glow Spectrometer. In most cases, you will be able to get at least two Potency Conduits, 
And in most cases, the two best potency condiments for you to use are going to be Depths of Insanity, which increases the duration of Recklessness, and Ashen Juggernaut, which gives Execute a stacking buff that increases the crit chance of subsequent Executes. The Covenant-specific potency condiments are occasionally quite useful. The Night Fade potency conduit Destructive Reverberations increases the damage of Ancient Aftershock and reduces its cooldown, which is a strong option in AoE scenarios. The Kyrian potency conduit Piercing Verdict increases the instant damage of Spear of Bastion as well as increasing the rage that it generates, making it once again another strong option for AoE scenarios. The Necrolord potency conduit Veteran's Repute makes Banner give you a percent increase to your strength, which is extremely nice. The Venthyr potency conduit Harrowing Punishment increases the damage of Condemn based on how many enemies are nearby. This conduit would have the potential to be good if it were not for the fact that unless mobs are literally right on top of you, they will be considered to be too far away to grant the extra damage. Prior to patch 9.1, Signet of Tormented Kings was the best legendary for both single target and AoE DPS for Fury Warriors. Now in patch 9.1, Covenant specific legendaries have been added to the game, and all of these new legendaries are the best choice for what each Covenant is good at. The new Venthyr legendary Sinful Surge makes Condemn extend the duration of Recklessness by 2 seconds. This is the best single target legendary for Venthyr Fury Warriors, and when using this legendary, it's best to talent into Dragon's War and Anger Management, though it is worth noting that for certain fight durations, it will be better to take Reckless Abandon instead of Anger Management, so make sure that you sim yourself and be mindful of the fight duration settings. For AoE, Signet is still king for Venthyr, and if you're going to be running Signet, then obviously you're going to want to be spec'd into Bladestorm and Anger Management so that you can maximize the number of times you get the extra buff from the Legendary. The new Night Fae Legendary Nature's Fury increases the duration of the Ancient Aftershock ground effect and adds a stacking dot to enemies that are within it. This Legendary is capable of doing more single target and AoE DPS than Signet of Tormented Kings, however, there's a catch. Your target needs to be in the ground effect for the entire 15 second duration in order to maximize the benefit of this legendary. Now, in reality, it's not terribly common that a boss or pack of mobs are going to be stationary for that long of time, so in scenarios where lots of movement is likely, Signet will outperform Nature's Fury in both single target and AoE. If you decide to use Nature's Fury, on single target fights you should switch your talents to use Dragon's Roar and Siegebreaker. The new Necrolore legendary called Glory makes your Conqueror's banner apply to an additional person, and makes it so that spending rage increases the duration of your personal banner buff. While this legendary does less personal DPS than Signet, it provides more net raid DPS, meaning that if you're going to be going Necrolore to maximize the benefit to your group, then you should be using this legendary. And this is true for both single target fights and AoE fights. The new Kyrian legendary Elysian Might doubles the duration of the ground effect of your Spirit Bastion, and makes standing in that ground effect increase your crit damage. This legendary does slightly less single target DPS than Signet of Tormented Kings, so on single target fights you should be using Signet, however, it does do more AoE DPS, so on AoE fights and also in Mythic Plus, you should be using Elysian Might. Using this legendary doesn't require you to change any talents from the default single target and AoE builds. Generally speaking, Haste and Mastery are the two best secondary stats for Fury, followed by Versatility and Crit. Now, your stat priorities will change depending on pretty much every single variable that I've talked about in this video, plus the stats on your current gear. You should run a stat weights simulation on raid bots with your personal setup to get a much more accurate understanding of what stats are best for you right now. A new system added in 9.1 are what are called Domination Shards. Certain items within the new Sanctum of Domination raid will have what are called Domination Sockets, and these sockets can be filled with Domination Shards. Domination Shards are like gems, but they typically have a proc effect rather than just having stats. There are three different types of shards, Blood, Frost, and Unholy Shards. Within each type of shard, there will be a Damage Shard, a Healing Shard, and a Defensive slash Tertiary Shard. If you socket all three shards of a type, then you're going to get a set bonus depending on which shard type is socketed. Now, only certain item slots can have domination sockets, and for warriors, these slots are our helm, shoulders, chest, bracers, and gloves. Because of how strong domination shards are, ideally, you should be looking to get all five sockets, which means that you don't want to craft your legendary on one of these slots if at all possible, because your legendary item will not have a domination socket on it. Once you have all five sockets, the most optimal thing to do is to get the unholy set bonus called Chaos Bane, which works the same way as the Shadowmoor legendary effect that it's named after. This bonus provides a stacking strength buff that will explode once it reaches maximum stacks, doing AoE damage, and then gives you a large strength buff for 15 seconds. With the remaining two domination sockets, you should be looking to get the frost damage shard, which gives you increased damage for 20 seconds when you've hit an enemy that you haven't touched yet, and then the blood damage shard, which increases your damage when you have 50% or more HP than your target. When you only have one or two domination sockets, you should first be looking to get the unholy damage shard, which provides a stacking percent damage increase, 
and then either the blood damage shard for single target DPS or the frost damage shard for AoE DPS and Mythic Plus. Now at this point I've covered everything, but there was a lot talked about, so let's put it all together as succinctly as possible. When playing a Fury Warrior, your goal is to generate rage as quickly as possible, and then once you get 80 rage, you should spend it on Rampage. In between Rampages, you should prioritize using Execute if it's available, and if not, you should prioritize using Raging Blow. If you can't use Raging Blow, you should use Bloodthirst. However, if you're not enraged, you should prioritize using Bloodthirst over Raging Blow if you have to decide between the two. If you can't use Execute, Raging Blow, or Bloodthirst, then you should fill that GCD with Whirlwind. If you're in a two-target cleave fight, then you're going to want to make sure that you have the Whirlwind buff up for every Rampage. If there's three or more targets, then you should maintain the Whirlwind buff so that you can cleave all of your damaging abilities. Your best two secondary stats are Haste and Mastery, but you should sim yourself because it can vary a lot. For Domination Shards, the best set bonus to go for is the Unholy bonus. After that, you should get the Frost Damage Shard and the Blood Damage Shard. Gear with Domination Sockets can only spawn on Helm, Shoulders, Chest, Bracers, and Gloves, and so if possible, you should avoid crafting your Legendary on one of these slots so that you can get the maximum of 5 Domination Shards. If all you care about is single target DPS, then Venthyr is the best choice of Covenant for you, and you should craft the Sinful Surge Legendary. For talents, you should get Sudden Death, Double Time, Massacre, War Paint, Cruelty, Dragon's Roar, and Anger Management. For AoE fights, you should use the Signet of Tormented Kings Legendary, and Spec into Bladestorm and Fresh Meat. Regardless of the number of targets, you should Soulbind with Nadja and make sure to get Dauntless Duelist. If what you care about is being able to have both competitive single target and AoE DPS, or you're primarily focused on Mythic Plus, then you can choose Night Fae for more burst AoE DPS and extra movement options, or you can go Kyrian for more consistent AoE DPS and more group utility. If you go Night Fae, your best legendary is technically Nature's Fury for both single target and AoE fights, but it's a sim trap and requires the mob to never move, so it's probably just safer to use Signet of Tormented Kings if you anticipate that there will be mob movement during the encounter. For single target DPS, you're going to use the standard build of Sudden Death, Double Time, Frenzy, War Paint, Cruelty, Bladestorm, and Anger Management if you're using Signet. If you decide to gamble with Nature's Fury, then switch to using Dragon's Roar instead of Bladestorm and Siegebreaker instead of Anger Management. For AoE fights, you're going to take the standard AoE build of Fresh Meat, Double Time, Massacre, War Paint, Cruelty, Bladestorm, and Anger Management, regardless of which legendary you use. For single target fights, you're going to want to Soulbind with Naya and make sure that you get Burrs. And then for AoE fights and Mythic Plus, you're going to want to Soulbind with Karain and make sure that you get First Strike. If you decide to go Kyrian, then you're going to want to use Signet of Tormented Kings for single target fights and Elysian Might for AoE fights. Both legendaries use the same default single target and AoE builds, just like Night Fae does when using Signet. For single target fights, it's best to Soulbind with Pelagos and grab Better Together. And for AoE fights, it's best to Soulbind with Mikanikos and grab Hammer of Genesis. If all you care about is being the real MVP, then Necrolord is the best choice as it provides the most net raid DPS. If you go Necrolord, your best legendary is going to be Glory. For talents, Necrolord uses the standard single target and AoE builds. And for single target fights, you're going to want to Soulbind with Bonesmith Hermir, making sure to grab Marrow Gemstone. For AoE fights, it's best to Soulbind with Emony while making sure to grab Gnashing Chompers. And that's everything that I think you need to know in order to successfully play a Fury Warrior in Shadowlands Patch 9.1. I sincerely hope that this guide has been helpful for you. As patches, hotfixes, and new theory crafting discoveries occur and change what the best practices are for Fury Warriors, I will be making videos discussing and analyzing them. If you're confused about any part of this guide, feel free to ask and I will do my best to help you out. Alternatively, tell me why what I've said is wrong and why my opinions are dumb. Lastly, I just want to say thank you for watching this video and subscribe for more.